Nancy, can you hear me better? Uh, who among us is, has not wished to be the favorite son? Thus I am not just honored to be included among the Masculinities Week speakers, given that all of the other speakers come from other institutions, I'm thrilled to be included in the series as the favorite son. <laughs> so thanks Maybe. Nadia Palacios and the rest of the Gender for Equity staff for giving me this rare experience, which I will try to exploit to the fullest. <laughs> To begin, I will steal a phrase from one of my confreres in this speaker series. Jackson Katz titled the book, The Macho Paradox. I will also speak to you of a macho paradox, but not in the sense that Katz does. I use the word macho because I am talking about Spanish-speaking men who use the words such as macho, machista, machismo, and machito in their, con in their context to categorize better and worse ways to be a man. I also use the word paradox in a narrower sense than Katz to refer to a particular paradox related to the visibility of the male body. Jacques Lacan, near the end of the signification of the phallus, writes that la parade virile, that is, manly display, itself appears feminine. It is worth asking why manly display comes off as feminine. Wouldn't you think that manly display would appear masculine? In beginning to answer that question, I call attention to the phrase la parade virile. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, but you can read it. <laughs> which I only provisionally translate as manly display. I will use manly and manliness rather than the English words virile and virility throughout my talk because I think they better capture what those words mean to French speakers and to Spanish speakers. Virile in English refers specifically to manly potency. Viril for Spanish and I think French speakers refers more specifically to what we call manliness, which includes but is not limited to male potency. Now as for Parade, in Bruce, Frink, Bruce Fink's translation of Lacan's écrit, um, Parade is translated, translated as display, but something is veiled over by that translation. According to LaRousse, Parade is not just a display but it is the particular sequence of ritualized movements performed as a prelude to mating, with the effect of capturing the attention of the eventual sex partner. Almost as an afterthought, LaRousse observes that in most cases, it is the male who's in the lead. Think of peacocks. Isn't there something feminine to us about a peacock strutting his stuff to capture the attention of a peahen? Or think of Austin Powers strutting his stuff for the fembots. <laughs> is it possible to strut manly stuff without coming off as feminine? Or think of Joan Rivier's famous essay on womanliness as masquerade. Parading about is what women do to appear womanly. Parading about is not what men do to appear manly. Now let's move from peacocks and fembots and womanliness to just plain cocks. <laughs> it may be because I, because I speak Spanish and I do not speak French that I hear in Lacan's Paradiria a reference to an erect penis. This is because parado in Spanish can refer to anything that is standing up, including a penis that is erect. But I think there's good reason to suppose that for Lacan too, la parade viril evoked an erect penis because, as Morat Aydemir demonstrates, the signification of the phallus is filled with double entendres concerning erection, copulation, and ejaculation. Consider this sentence. All these propositions do uh, more than veil over the fact that phallus that the phallic signifier cannot play its role unless it is veiled. Uh, that is to say, as itself assigning the latency with which everything signifiable is struck from the moment that it is, it is raised to the function of the signifier. Sorry, so I do, can do no more than veil over the fact. Murat Edimir observes that frappe means not only struck, but also thrusted into, or fucked, and elevé, or aufgehoben, is a double entendre in two languages meaning not just sublated in the Hegelian sense, but also uplifted. In other words, writes Ademir, the phallus becomes erect and penetrates, strikes, or fucks the signifiable. Thus I believe I'm justified in hearing Lacan's mention of La Parade Viril at the end of the signification of the phallus as a reference to erection. Without dawdling anymore on this particular essay, I will assert for, that from the first page of the signification of the phallus to the last, Lacan suggests that to uphold the appearance of manliness, a man and his manhood must remain veiled, cloaked, or hidden. Whatever else you do, manliness requires that we, that we pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. 
As Calvin Thomas explains, there is an anxious masculine relationship to the body and to the visibility of that body. To assuage this anxiety, Thomas observed, the tricks would be to attempt to stay out of the picture altogether or to make woman the object of the gaze. In other words, don't pay attention to the bodies behind the curtain, pay attention to female bodies instead. Thomas argues that critical theorists reproduce the culture we, meet, we mean to critique to the extent that we focus our efforts on historicizing the visibility of feminine masquerade to the exclusion of focusing them on historicizing invisibility of masculine masquerade, that is, the disappearance of male bodies. Thomas is not suggesting that scholars stop studying the specularization of female bodies, only that we should also study the mechanisms by which male bodies are presumed to escape the spectacle. Okay, now that we've heard a bit from Lacan and from the great and powerful Oz, I turn to the culturally specific ways that Argentine men try to assuage the anxiety that stems from the display of male bodies. I'll begin with El Matadero, a short story written in 1838 by Esteban Echeverria and published posthumously in 1871. The story is a foundational fiction, not only because it is the very first Latin American short story, but also because it laid out terms by which two classes of Argentine men competed to prove their own manliness and cast doubt on the manliness of the men of the other class. Have any of you read this story? In the first half of Echeverria's story, an animal of uncertain sex is brought to a slaughterhouse, and after a terrible struggle, it is killed and then castrated by the slaughterhouse workers. The workers are identified as federales, the Federal Party, which controlled Argentina at the time of the story's setting, was associated with the Creole-identified working-class men who defined manliness in terms of strength. Federales were opposed by unitarios, such as Echeverria, who were associated with the European-identified landowning class of men who defined manliness in terms of civility. In the second half of the story, an unitario passes by the slaughterhouse and the Federales drag him from his horse and into the slaughterhouse. As they are about to sodomize him or castrate him, the unitario dies of rage. The standard take on El Matadero is that it is, a, that it is unitario propaganda aimed at disparaging federales by representing them as barbarian brutes who are filled with hypocritical piety. They think the roughness makes them manly, but the story reveals that it does not. The federales are seen as seeking to confirm their manliness by slaughtering a bull in the first half of the story and by ganging up on an unitario in the second. But it is clear that the true machos of the story are the bull and the unitario, each of whom dies with his manhood intact. That is to say, the bull is not castrated until after he is killed, when the unitario dies nobly before he can be castrated or, or sodomized. That's how the story is taught in Argentine high schools where it is required reading. 